We've probably already seen these cloudy sky cabochons popping up all over online and in trendy boho jewelry. And instead of natural stones, which at first I was like, wow, that's like really cool agate. Like I didn't know they came in that blue. No, it's actually uh, not a natural occurrence. It is what I like to call natural with some human intervention. In a way, this tutorial is a lot like my doublets tutorial, and I'll link that in the description below, where you're basically backing one stone with another stone. So in this case, it would be a colored stone under a translucent stone. But I'll have to say that this method is so much quicker and cheaper than the other one. The idea here is that we're mixing different colorants into epoxy. So I'll be going over two methods to do the color, both with mica powders and with liquid dyes. And I know what you're thinking. Why would you mix liquid and epoxy? That's like a recipe for disaster. But I will just like hold your horses and I'll go over the pros and cons of each one as well as some troubleshooting tips because there's a, a lot of things that you want to do to prep your stone for the best adhesion. You guys already know how I roll. I'll have all the materials for this project that you need in the description below along with a link if you'd like to send over a donation if you've been really getting a lot out of my lapidary videos. And I actually want to take a moment to thank Nancy, Bob, David, and Paige for their recent generous donations. Thank you so much. Your support means so much to me and it inspires me to keep making some great videos for you guys. So without further ado, let's go make some things blue. <laughs> First of all, you want to find some nice plume agate for this project. I'm starting out with some thin slabettes of graveyard plume, but you could also just buy some plume cabochons if you don't have a cabbing setup and it just kind of makes your life a lot easier. <laughs> Uh, I have a list of other plume options in the description below, but you want to be sure that they are cut thin, like maybe three to four millimeters uh, that these ones were sliced at. Uh, you want them on a thinner side so that the color will show clearly through the chalcedony windows between the plumes, but also the backing will add another few millimeters of height to your stone as well. So that's something to think about. Another thing you want to look out for is that the chalcedony isn't too foggy since that'll keep the background color from really showing through the stone. One way to test this if you have a slabs actually in your hand or available is to put down a piece of tape on your table and place the slabs on it. Take a look. The color isn't nearly as vibrant through the stone since it's a tad cloudy, but this seems perfect for me. As I look at both sides, I try to decide which should be the face of the cabochon. Um, I try to see which side has the most visual depth since some sides just look like the plumes are like right in the front plane of the stone, um, whereas other sides it has like a little bit more of like a foreground, middle ground, and background. It kind of gives that visual illusion of like this like terrain of clouds. Once you've picked a front of your stone, you can draw some pencil lines on the back side and use a flat lap to grind the bottom down flush. Keep cutting until all that pencil line disappears, but the two goals here are to flatten the bottom and to leave a very rough surface for the epoxy to have a good strong bond with. Now this is my 80 grit flat lap on my high tech diamond angled flat lap, and I wouldn't suggest doing anything lower than that since I will show you in a bit what happens if you try to polish the backside before adding the colored layer. And trust me, it's something that won't make you happy. <laughs> Instead of just doing this epoxy technique over a whole slab, I find that you have less adhesion issues if you actually cut your cab preforms in advance. I also did some slight shaping already um, just to help see what the clarity situation is going to be like, but that's not completely necessary. Then we'll place it on our candle warmer, and as some of you already know from my other tutorials, this helps remove any moisture in the stone before we epoxy, since the epoxy doesn't like the whole lot of water, and we want to do anything we can to promote a better bond. I already had these Pearl X pigments on hand for my painting days, but it's basically all it is is mica ground up to make a shimmery powder. Some actual pigment is actually added too, but it doesn't have the same color saturation as pigment powder, which is going to create like a more solid, vibrant color in comparison. Um, what's really cool about these is, is the shimmery effect, um, and some even have what is called like an interference color. So like this one here is called interference blue or purple with interference. Um, so it has a blue shimmery cast when the light hits it just right. I also got this set of blue powders on Amazon from Eye Candy for this tutorial, and I found them to be absolutely gorgeous. I thought they were actually going to be a matte powder, but I'm not mad about this purchase. I actually found it hard to find a matte or like a solid color pigment powder since mica powders kept popping up here and there. Um, so you might even consider looking for pigments for painters since many hardcore painters, if you didn't know, will mix their own paints using dry pigments. It's going to be a lot more expensive since you're paying for a lot more pigment um, compared to the mica powder, but you won't have that same kind of um, variety pack that have a bunch of different colors. And I personally like getting a bunch of different flavors. So you might find that worth looking into depending on kind of what your needs are for the project. 
I also got a white mica powder because you never know when you want to tone some of those colors down a little bit more. The other option for getting a more solid color is using liquid dyes. I ended up using these India inks that I had, but there are a few caveats to this. The first is that dyes tend to be more translucent compared to pigment powder. In my research, I also found that liquid dyes are, can be found to degrade significantly faster in UV light compared to powders. But once again, I don't know what that threshold hit is. Like if this was in jewelry, how much outdoor time would that equate to? Um, but it's just something to think about when making a decision um, which way you want to go with this project. Um, the last issue I have is that with the liquid dyes, it doesn't really sit right with me to be mixing in a liquid with an epoxy since water can prevent epoxy from curing properly. Um, but there are some ways to be careful and work around this, which I'll go over in a few minutes. Then as another option, there's also pigment paste that I've heard about, but I can't justify right now buying even more colorants. So if that piques your interest, you might decide to look into that a little bit more too. All right, so here we go. We're gonna be using our trusty epoxy 330 for this. It's water clear and non-yelling, which is great because if you did use an epoxy that yellows as it ages, you'd end up having a green color over time. You know, blue and yellow make green and all. The best epoxy out there on the market is Hextall, but it's like $50 for a quarter pound kit. So it's not always affordable for most lapidaries. And here I'm mixing up equal parts resin to hardener, and you basically just need enough to make like a couple millimeters thick layer on the back of your stone. What I like to do is mix up just a bit more than I need and just have some spare translucent stones available to use up whatever epoxy mixture I have left. One thing that isn't always thought of is how greasy our hands are or how dusty our studios are, so it's always good to use an alcohol-soaked Q-tip to clean off any dirt, dust, grease off the back of your stone before you add the epoxy. All right, so here's the pro tip here. You're gonna to want to mix the epoxy for at least five minutes before you start adding any pigment or dye into it since you want all that chemical bonding process to happen before you start adding stuff to it. It's best if your studio isn't too hot or too cold since that can also affect the epoxy curing too. With any additives that you're mixing into your epoxy, there's a certain threshold before you start screwing around with its integrity. And from what I've read, that max limit is like 5% color to resin by volume or one part color to 20 parts epoxy. If you're like me, knowing this is helpful, but also like, huh? So clearly this measuring out of color is going to require a bit of creativity, whether you want to spread out your epoxy uh, and draw kind of like a checkerboard in it with your mixing sticks, you can better see and visualize what 20 parts looks like to help you approximate your pigment or dye from the hair. Uh, so that's one way to do it or you could just kind of go rogue like I pretty much did and slowly add color at a time, erring on the side of less pigment than too much. And also gloves are highly suggested. I don't know why I don't wear them, um, but that's all I'm gonna say about that. So you can see I'm using a clean mixing stick to just get small amounts of mica powder out at a time. I chose this eye candy rainbow blue. I do wear a respirator when I'm working with these powders since they literally become airborne as soon as you open the dang plastic bag and no one needs sparkly lungs. But the idea here is add a little bit of pigment, mix, then spread some on the back of your stone. You can then flip it over to see if you like the pigment density. And this is kind of why I like having somewhat of a pre-shaped cab because you can get a better feel of how it's gonna come out in the end. So I still think this one needs a bit more pigment, so I'll scrape it off my stone, add more powder, mix, etc. Basically keep doing that until you get the color that you want. And I actually also ended up adding a little bit of white mica powder to ooh in mine just for fun because uh, it doesn't hurt, right? So when you're applying the epoxy layer on your stone for like the final round now, make sure that you're using your mixing sticks to draw out the epoxy from the middle to the edge of the stone since I find that the epoxy totally wants to bulge like right in the center of your stone and this will kind of help even it out. Or here's another pro tip, go ahead and get yourself some wax paper. It's not just for cooking. Uh, what you can do is cut them into like small little pieces and then press the epoxy bottom on that gently until the epoxy starts to show kind of around all sides of the stone. Once you let that cure on the paper, what after you know the 24 hours, it'll come off the paper really, really easily and have the flat bottom. You can only use that one side um, on the paper, you can't really reuse the paper. You can use the back side because the wax will actually come off with the epoxy in the stone. And if you're gonna do that technique with the wax paper, I also recommend putting a little extra glue on. I'd rather have um, more saturation because obviously when you press it down, you're thinning out that, that band of epoxy. So make sure you have a thick enough layer on the bottom as you start to press down on that. It'll, you know, might have to practice a little bit, but you'll get good at it the more you do it. 
And since I have some spare epoxy um, that I haven't used yet, I will pull out some bubble opals that I have lying around and do the epoxy backing on those as well. I also just sampled with that purple blue interference mica powder from the Pearl X Series 1 kit. So basically the same concept though with the mixing that I did with the previous blue color. Now onto the liquid dyes. Think of these dyes kind of like food coloring. Now if you put that in water, it kind of is dark and translucent. But if you add food coloring to white cake batter, you get this rich opaque color. That's the same kind of thing that I'm gonna do here. So I'll be adding this opaque white dye to my translucent blue dye to get a nice solid opaque color for my sky. Because the pigment in these liquid dyes kind of settle to the bottom, make sure to give them a really good shake to kind of mix everything together before you start using them. Now, when I'm trying to fish out small amounts of dye out of these containers, I like to use a mixing stick that has already been used to mix epoxy like a few days ago. So it kind of has this layer of hardened epoxy on the end of the stick. This way the dye isn't just soaking into the wood and like I'm like wasting all that beautiful color. It actually just forms like a, kind of like a little droplet on the end of the stick. But I'll start with adding just a little bit of blue mixing it in and then adding some white and testing it on my stone. I usually never get the perfect color in one try, so I recommend adding very tiny bits at a time since you'd hate to overdo the color right off the bat. Like I mentioned before, epoxy doesn't like water, so even if there is a threshold max for adding dyes, I'd prefer to have way less than that and basically only add the amount of dye necessary to get the color I want. So that's kind of your workaround is like less is more. <laughs> if anything, you could always do a few layers of epoxy or one thicker layer to get that color density that you're looking for. So you're going to let that cure for 24 hours and we'll come back to it the next day to kind of flatten the backside. But now is probably a good time to talk about some troubleshooting tips. Now, if you're going to cut the sides of your cab um, and it starts to peel like this, here are a few things to consider. So as a test for this particular stone, I actually did polish the bottom of the stone up to 280 resin wheels. So that's truly not a high polish per se, but um, it's not really a rough surface either. And I promise you, once you add your colored epoxy, it will fill in all those 80 grit scratch marks on the bottom of your stone. So definitely make sure to have that there for the physical bond. You won't notice them later. Now, I also didn't use alcohol to clean the bottom of my stone. So chances are there could have been kind of like a resist of like grease or dust, kind of keeping that epoxy from bonding well to the stone. So that's something to really think about as you're moving forward with this project. Then the third troubleshooting um, kind of question is, did you add too much pigment powder? Did you add too much liquid? If it feels like you did everything else right, uh, but it's still like lifting, maybe back down on the colorants and see how it goes from there. All right, now that the stones are cured, it's time to deal with the bottom of the stone since once again, the epoxy is gonna make like a little hill that we'll need to flatten down so it'll sit nicely in a bezel. As you saw in some of my examples, you could even flatten the epoxy layer and then epoxy that to a back plate, um, making kind of like a triplet with the epoxy sandwich <laughs> or something like that. Anyways, this is a great option for wire wrappers who usually have the sides and the backs of their stones exposed in the designs. Uh, it's also good for jewelry pieces that might have like a cutout back. So basically it just depends on the end game of this piece. But for me, uh, just flattening the backside and adding a bevel on the bottom epoxy will be enough for me. Now I could have just taken this over to my high tech diamond angled flat lap, but I had already pretty much polished these stones. and I didn't want to lose my grip on it and have it go flying everywhere. So I'll just cut down the bottom on my cab king wheels here as flat as I can. I just brought the back of mine to the 220 resin wheel, but you can fully polish the epoxy backing if you want. Then you can go ahead and polish the top part of your stone. And then we're done. Pretty simple, right? Now we can do a little comparison between the different ways of coloring the epoxy. So on the left, we have this round cab, and that's the one I did with the liquid dyes. And then the three stones on the right were all done with the micro powder using pretty much the same epoxy mixture. So they're all about the same tinting strength, except I think I did add a little more blue mica powder for the bubble opals. So comparing this bubble opal on the left to the plume agate on the right, it doesn't look like it's even the same color, but this is where the clarity really comes into play. The bubble opal I collected in Utah can be very translucent, like a high quality quartz, where uh, this particular piece of plume is pretty cloudy, so it looks more like a hazy sky. And here are the two pieces of bubble opal. Well, they're, they're pretty much the same color. But if we go over here and compare the liquid dye to the mica powder, you can see that the mica powder does have that little bit of a yellowish kind of shimmer to it through that not as transparent agate. Now, it's really hard to compare because these are two different colors 
all together, but they're pretty close. Um, and it's easier to see this comparing the bubble opal to the clear plume agate. Um, you can see they're, they're same, but not quite. Then lastly, here is the purple blue interference mica powder under the plume agate. Now there is a healed fracture in the stone that runs along the Z axis and it kind of gets in the way of the shimmer, but you can see a little bit of that interference kind of color kind of popping up in the top right corner when the light hits the stone at a certain angle. And then just so you can see it, um, here's some natural light just to see the shimmer a bit better. I honestly can see the application opportunities for both the solid dye and the mica powder. Personally, I don't think I'd want to have that shimmer in all of my cabs. I mean, it could be kind of gimmicky since I, I don't know. I really like the simplicity of the solid color, but I know I'm going to save up for some good matte pigment powders without the mica or even try playing around with adding a non micaceous powder, something like ground up white chalk to see if that reduces or eliminates needs the shimmer, um, which it should to some degree. Then here are my bubble opals in the sun. Uh, as you guys might already know, the bubble opals have this white chatoyance in the stone already. Um, so it lends itself well, actually, with the extra shimmer from that rainbow blue mica powder I used on these. At the end of the day, this technique is just something else fun to consider if you're open-minded about calves with a little bit more human intervention and you're not like a complete purist. Uh, like I said, just get in your shop and have some fun. If it doesn't work out, just grind the epoxy backing off and try again. You don't have a whole lot to lose with trying this out. Um, so definitely give it a try. Let me know how your projects are coming out in the comments below because you know I love hearing from you. Um, so go get after it and happy calving, y'all.